Well, hello. I'd like to welcome you all to episode 22 of the DanJohnWorkouts.com podcast. It's always nice to have you here. Well, let's dive right in this week because we have a lot of questions. This is from Toby. Uh, Toby's a, a fun name in my family. Uh, we use it to, every squirrel is always called Toby in our home. So, well, I, I hope you're not the one that's been harassing me recently. Well, Toby asks, I was wondering if you could talk about your systems for introducing and coaching plyometrics, developing speed, and energy systems for athletes. Well, it's not going to be very complex because I work with mostly power athletes, but I want to kind of go through a couple things. Um, years ago, we taught a system to, um, and I believe the guy was named McNair. Uh, he came to Utah, he did a workshop, and he taught us a very good system for teaching athletes to improve their sprint mechanics. And I remember being at a thing one time and uh, Greg Shepard at Bigger, Faster, Stronger had this guy. And uh, Greg showed him these mechanics and the guy goes, in Soviet Russia, we teach that when they are five years old. And that's the first time I realized just how full of crap most people are. Uh, many athletes will come to you when you're coaching with very poor sprint mechanics. Um, there's a whole sport that teaches horrible sprinting and that sport is sometimes called soccer, or in Europe, it's called football. Uh, but you'll get these young ladies who come out of a track and they run like this, you know, and it's terrible. So you, you do need to work on the basics. Um, it is well worth your time to teach your children uh, the basics of appropriate sprint technique. But that does have, that's got a load limit. You're not going to get a kid who runs a 5 4 40 to run a 4 4 40 just by, you know, teaching them the pull and lock or you know, do something with their legs or anything. Um, a big issue when we're coaching young uh, sprinters, uh, and we actually in the weight room can work on this with the suitcase carry, is there's a real tendency for them to to have a wobble, a wobbling head, which leads to a wobbling body. And so one of the things I try to do, and at the track it's easy because you have lines, is when you teach a kid to run on the line, it's, it's just a drill. But the idea is that they're on the line, when the right foot is grounded, the head is over the right foot. When the left foot is grounded, the head is over the left foot. And it teaches them that ability to say smooth in the lane. Uh, so, yeah, really. So I, I would spend more time on mechanics with a younger athlete. But the truth is, if, if somebody shows up and this is what they need in their, I don't know, 27, this is what they need and you have to work on it. Uh, I think as a strength coach, and this comes, you know, there's nothing new about this. I think there's some ways we can de uh, to get an athlete faster. Um, it's not going to shock anybody. I mean, it's going to be the Olympic lifts, uh, snatch and clean and jerk, uh, power cleans probably, power snatches power, uh, probably. In the kettlebell world, uh, if you do it correctly, I, I think kettlebell swings can help. Uh, not so much the power from the glute, but that weird kind of hinge flexibility that you get from doing kettlebell swings. I, I am going to nod uh, and tell you that I think two people are much smarter than I am to go over this. And that's, of course, Barry Ross. And Barry recommended uh, deadlifts and bench press. And that's it. Uh, get somebody really, really strong in the deadlift. Uh, oh, he always had their, his athletes drop the bar. He never, he never wanted the eccentric because he didn't want them to get sore. And he believed they needed some kind of upper body strength. And so he just picked the bench press because that's what he picked. Uh, Charlie Francis, the great Canadian coach, didn't care what you did in the weight room as long as you didn't change things up. His big fear, and this is fascinating, was he never wanted his sprinters to be sore. So if you decided you're going to do half squat, uh, lat pull down, and machine bench press, well, those are your exercises. Just don't switch them. Uh, really a different view. Uh, you have some things down here. First off, plyometrics. Um, I was there when plyometrics were the first, you know, were the answer to all questions. The word plyometrics, of course, as everyone knows, probably no one, is a term invented by Fred Wilt, who uh, was the editor of Track Technique, who also loved to throw the hammer uh, on his own all the time. I guess he wasn't very good. He loved the feel of the hammer throw. So Fred Wilt came up with this word. Uh, there's nothing new about it. I mean, you know, I've got... I've got stuff from the early 1960s from both the Germans and the Soviets doing these kinds of things. 
but it was when Pat Masdorf broke the world record. Uh, probably, he's probably one of the last four or five people to break the world record in the high jump using a straddle technique versus the Fosbury. And he did something he coined depth jumping. And that's where you step off a table and bounce back up on it. Step it off, bounce back up. And of course, whenever somebody breaks the world record in track, uh, you laugh about what they do until they break the world record, and then that becomes the gospel. That's the only thing you can do. Um, you got to be very careful with plyometrics. I still, I remember being at a school, uh, I don't want to mention Judge Memorial's name, but I was at a school where we had a new track coach who just basically said, plyometrics, that's all the kids need, plyometrics. Well, the research doesn't agree with that. You know, the Germans who did a lot of research on plyos said, you needed a double body weight squat before you get any use out of plyos. Well, the number of athletes you're going to work with in high school who can double body weight squat is going to be low, but those who do are going to be pretty damn good. So I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say here is this. Um, foundationally, start there with proper technique. Uh, get reasonably strong in like the deadlift. I would say you'd probably have to sneak up on a double body weight deadlift for everybody. Uh, and then you can start looking at some other things. Um, the best way I know how to develop speed, uh, once you've done the sprint mechanics work, the strength work, is competition. Um, when Charlie Francis was talking here in Utah, up, up in Ogden, it was brilliant talk. I think it was the last workshop he ever did before he died. He said something that really lit my mind up. He said, one of the problems with American collegiate sprinters is that when they finally go into the open competitions, all they do is train and race. And I thought, I'm sitting here going, well, yeah, that's track and field, isn't it? He goes, what they were doing in college, though, is they would go to the Texas relays, and someone would hand them the baton in the 4x200 race, and someone else would be ahead of them. So they had to practice trying to pass people, which, of course, is working on speed. The best way I know to increase speed is to race people and to have a variety of ways of racing people. Um, you know, when you're a high school football coach, and I don't agree with this, but a lot of them do it, uh, they'll have, you'll be doing wind sprints and you'll say, whoever finishes first can go in, you're done for the day. Well, those guys have been kind of just being lazy the entire time. Well, all of a sudden race and win their heat so they can go in early. Um, racing is the best way to increase speed and you can do it by running, having your athlete run the four by one, the four by two invent races. Uh, we at Southwood junior high, our coaches were masters in getting people to run laps by having them race practice was just a series of races. Um, when you talk about energy systems, uh, you're outside of my uh, area, but I know this, um, uh, for me, I'm always going to go back to the classic methods of track and field, no matter what events you do. Uh, we're going to have an off season where we're going to work on your weaknesses and uh, expanding your base. There's going to be a preseason where we start to cut things down and increase the intensity. And then, of course, we're going to have the season where it's all about when the gun goes off or the official calls your name. Um, the East Germans had a great way to explain this accumulation, intensification, and transformation. I don't know the energy systems involved because the only thing I care about as a as a track coach is, well, first off, did they did they improve their uh, personal best? That's number one, and then number two, of course, did you win? Uh, to be honest, I have to kind of be honest with you, Toby. I think winning is more important, but that's just me. I hope that helped. We got a question from Johnny. I have a cousin named Johnny. Um, what are your thoughts on benefits or drawbacks to training barefoot indoors or with flat, low-rise shoes versus normal trainers? Boy, I tell you, Johnny, I was there. Uh, I'm the first person in the state of Utah to own a pair of Vibrams, uh, those five-fingered shoes. And I got to tell you, boy, those things could stink. Whew. Well, I got involved with, with the Vibram five-fingers because I went to a kettlebell certification and a couple of people told me that would actually be really good 
for my hips. Now, uh, if you've listened to my podcast, you know I was born with something called pistol grip hips. And the idea was if we could train my toes to be stronger, you know, you know, it's the it's going to go right up. It's the structure. If I can get that trampoline effect back in my toes and feet, that would, you know, help my ankles, it'd help my knees, and it would slide up and help my hips. Um, the, the downside of going barefoot at first is you are, you'll be shocked at uh, uh, how exhausted your feet and kind of your Achilles tendon will get at first. Uh, do I believe that they have value? Yeah, I think so. And I think that as best you can, walking barefoot has great value. I don't want to get into the whole thing they call it grounding now, where your your ions, your negative ions, get poured into the earth. And I mean, I, it might be true, but that seems a little bit. Well, folks, it, it be straight up. I, I don't believe in a lot of this stuff. For example, I don't believe in astrology. You know, uh, well, I'm a Virgo, and we tend to be skeptical. I'll, I'll wait for you to stop laughing. Um, that was, that was a joke, in case you're wondering, uh, gentle listener. Um, yeah, there, I think there's great value in them. Uh, there's also value in wearing shoes, especially where I live, because of uh, asphalt, broken glass, uh, <laughs> the rocks that we live here in Utah. So it's going to be, and I like what you said here, benefits, drawbacks. There's going to be a back and forth on this. You know, McDougal's book, uh, born to run makes it seem like if you run barefoot, your cancer will be cured. Your, your, you'll instantly, you know, be a billionaire and you'll be able to fly. That's a he he kind of overemphasizes a little bit. At the same time, some people say ah, it's just a bunch of garbage. I think, as always, Johnny, the answer is uh, intelligent people can find a middle ground here. I do recommend going barefoot uh, when you can, when appropriate. Uh, just, you know, if you're, you're going to work out, make sure your your neighbor's dog hasn't been trained there, too. We have a question, a fairly long question uh, from Eric. I'm a 47-year-old man that has always been skinny. Uh, your longevity will thank you for that. I don't really have to watch my diet, we all hate you, to avoid gaining fat, even when I'm uh, sedentary for a decade. About six months ago, I stepped on a scale and it was and it was disturbed to see how little I weigh. I'm 5'8", and my weight has gradually trended down from the low to mid 140s in my 20s to 125. You actually, Eric, you remind me a lot of my father. I started training my weight and my strength has improved, but I'm not much heavier. I'm wondering what goals would be best for my long-term health. See, uh, gentle listeners who are not named Eric, you have to listen to what he's saying here. Um... For long-term health, we know uh, it's what I was taught by one of my former bosses. He uh, he went golfing one day, and uh, he's out with a, a guy who was 80, and the guy, he said, how do you live so long? And the guy who was 80 said, look around. You don't see any fat old guys. And that's when my old boss decided to get on the, uh, the low-carb kick and get his body weight down. Uh, in order to be healthy, active, and not frail in my 60s or 70s, should I work to get my weight up towards 140 pounds or more? Or is it sufficient to work on strength and conditioning, even if it's not a company with a significant weight gain? Well, you're 47, and after about 35, uh, you really want to focus on uh, hypertrophy, which bodybuilding, and joint mobility. You don't mention joint mobility here or anything. But yeah, we know that... We know now that, and this is, the research is new, it's fresh, it seems accurate, that little things like grip strength are one of the leading indicators of age. Um, I'm to the point now in my life where I'm going to be 63 this year, but that 63 is just this number that floats over there. Uh, I measure my age by how I feel, my strength levels in the weight room, and my energy levels. Um, if I didn't know I was 63, I'd probably be telling everybody I was 32. And that's kind of where you want to be. The stronger you are, uh, the, the better your prospects are for a healthy aging. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll live to be 170 if you have a, you know, if you, 
if you deadlift 600 pounds, it doesn't mean you're going to live longer, but a healthy aging is what I'm talking about. Um, personally, I don't want to be uh, in a bed in the fetal position for 10 years of my life dying. I don't want that. Uh, I want to be a, I want to have a healthy aging process. As Rob Wolf says, I want to live long and drop dead. That's what I would like. Um, if the weight's not coming, there are people, uh, my friend Crazy Jerry from college, Crazy Jerry couldn't put on weight to save his life. But he weight trained and he got very strong and it helped him in, in most aspects of life. You're an unusual person to write to me because you're the you're the guy who can eat what he wants and he's worried about losing weight. Uh, that's that's pretty unusual. I would uh, put if I were you, I'd take my hands and give myself a big hug because you lucked out. So yeah, keep your strength up, keep training, and don't worry about the scale. This is a good question from Scott. Um, just as a little uh, background check, the first published article I ever made in this field was on an exercise called the overhead squat. Um, and it's, I learned about its benefits on, uh, 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 check that, May 21st, 1988, when I went up to uh, Coach Ralph Mond's retirement track meet and I bumped into a couple of my old friends and they were, you know, these were all elite discus throwers. I mean, we probably had, I mean, we had really an impressive group, about 13 of us all historically good throwers. And one of the guys said, if I could do it again, I would do more overhead squats. So I, I published that article. As a side note, oddly, Bodybuilding Magazine took that article off the web and published it as their own. Now, the funny thing about the article is when I said that I wrote that, you should at least give my name on it, bodybuilding.com fought me and said, how can you prove you wrote this article? It was interesting because the article starts off, on May 21st, 1988, one week after I married Tiffany, we went up to the Ralph Mon track and field meet. So I challenged the editor if he could find anybody who had been married on May 14th, 1988, to someone named Tiffany, spelled T-I-F-F-I-N-I, -I, who competed in the discus throw that following weekend at the Ralph Mon track meet, please let me know because I'd like to meet them. They put my name on the article. And that's probably the best thing I can say. I will stop there. I am interested in what you think about the value or applicability of the overhead squat as a variation for the 60-plus-year-old athlete. You know what? Let's get back to the two words. Uh, done correctly, and it depends. Could you do this exercise? Done correctly, yes. Should you? It depends. I think for a 60-plus-year-old athlete, the overhead squat is going to be a secret weapon. But let's keep reading the question. I've been tra training regularly for years, but mainly stick to front squats due to three shoulder surgeries. Gentle listeners, do we all know what advice we're going to give Scott now? The advice we're going to give Scott now, of course, is this. It depends. If you had three shoulder surgeries, I don't know if they're going to get better. Should I work toward an overhead squat? And if so, what step should I take to get there? Scott, you're asking really at the bottom line, you're asking for medical advice, medical intervention. So what you're getting from me, the strength coach is, yeah, if you can do this exercise, I think it's going to have some real value for you. But maybe because of your injuries, you can't do it. So, I mean, you want to try, you know, what I teach. I teach the gobble squat combined with the uh, PVC or broomstick overhead squat. Try that out. But I think, and I would talk to a, a physical therapist, one you can trust, somebody who's got who knows weights, which is hard to find. If you're in Utah, I can help you out. And, and just go through it. Uh, on cost to benefit, the benefits might be good, but in your case with the three surgeries, one little twist, and you know, you know how those surgeries don't don't work as well as the original parts. So, uh, kind of a mixed response for me, and I apologize because I don't like to do that, but I, I I don't I I don't have the skill set to look at your MRI and say you should be fine. Uh, having said that. I like where your head's at on the journey. 
Make sure you do your goblet squats. Uh, I, I like that you're front squatting. And just stick with that and play around uh, during an off period with maybe just the broomsticks and see how that goes. Thank you. We have a very strange uh, name here. Uh, our next uh, our next question. The person's name is Anonymous. Anonymous is one of my least favorite people online. They're usually the guy that's got his thumbs underneath his suspenders telling us how great he was without any video or historical relevance. But let's just see what Anonymous has to say today. I'm 65 with decades of consistent training. I've been doing my own version of park bench workouts for a while now, but for the past four months, my progress has stopped. Well, that's, you know. I'm training three to four days per week with your basic movements and nothing is changing. Do you have any suggestions of breaking through these plateaus? Well, Mr. Anonymous or Miss Anonymous, Mer Anonymous, Menominous, um, it's... It's one of those things where I, I do need just a little bit more information because what do you mean by progress? Um, the, the One of the hard things, and, and many people, especially these internet experts, have led people to start believing is that improvement is always linear. And that's just not true, man. It's not true in any aspect of life. Uh, it's odd that people still believe that you can progress in a linear fashion for a long time. The fact that you've been training a long time is good. And here's another thing I actually like about uh, what you said here is that your progress has stopped for the past four months. There's a couple things. Let's go, let's, let's give you three options. The first option is the one most people ignore until, <laughs> I always joke that I only follow this advice uh, uh, with surgeries, but that's to take some time off. I remember when Carol Cady, she was the American record holder in the discus. She told me one time that the biggest mistake I was making is I wasn't taking six to eight weeks off a year and letting and letting my body recover. Here's the funny thing, uh, Anonymous. I don't now think it's your body that recovers. I think it's your brain. Uh, we used to have this thing in American football. We would talk about how you'd have a boy, he played his freshman year for you, sophomore year, and junior year for you, and the kid never really got it. But then like one day, the boy would be walking down the hall and go, oh, and everything would knit and tie together. And you had this kid you were afraid to put on the field, suddenly one of the best athletes out there. If he would have kept playing football every day in that off season, he wouldn't have made the improvement. Sometimes you just have to turn off everything and be walking down the street and go, oh, that's what I need. I think the brain likes to rewatch. That's why I've retired so many times as a discus thrower. Every time I retire and I swear I'm never going to throw again, that's when I'm mowing the lawn, shoveling the snow, walking the dog. And all of a sudden I have this insight that I always say, I wish I would have known this. I start throwing the discus and weirdly I throw even farther. That's option number one. Option number two is to get yourself on some kind of short-term, two-week, three-week, six-week, and now you're starting to do, my hand's doing this, you know, waffling a little bit. It's possible to go up to 12 weeks, but it's usually three weeks of some kind of like challenge. Now, you could do it nutritionally, like you could do uh, Phil Maffetone's two-week ketogenic diet. I don't know if it's going to help you or hurt you. It's two weeks, see what happens. Um, you could do a... A, what I call a bus bench program, one of those shorter term programs where you focus on something for a few weeks. Uh, you could do one of those challenges. Uh, uh, Pat Flynn has a bunch of these 21 day challenges. You can find, uh, oh, I have that 10,000 swing challenge, which for 65, might, you, you're going to have to measure that yourself. Okay. And then the third option. So take it off, take time off. Number two, a short term challenge, diet, focus. And number three is um, step back and look at look at your, your stall. Step back and look what's going on. Um, if, you're, if you've been doing three sets of eight for four months and you've stalled, you know, sliding to something as simple as five sets of three is going to completely change everything. 
Sometimes you need, it, it's a cliche now, but you need that 30,000 foot view on what's going on. You might not be stalled. You might, what might be happening is you just keep feeding the monkey the exact same thing. And what's happening is you get, the, this input gives you that output. And you're just in a position right now of stasis. You know, you're getting what you put in. Uh, am I saying that changing reps is going to be a miracle worker for you? Not necessarily, but it happens. Sometimes increasing load. Um, I noticed about two or three years ago, I got stalled and uh, I got a free membership to this gym over here. Uh, I don't want to give them any. They fired all my friends. So I won't talk about it. Um, but I went in and I started doing machine training. I started training machines for the first time since 1981 or 82 or maybe 86 and probably 85 when I was using the universal machine in a circuit. Well, getting on machines after doing barbells and kettlebells for decades, I mean, my everything worked. So those are three options I want you to think about. I want you, uh, and in fact, that's the order I'd like you to try them and take a little bit of time off, maybe just something like two weeks. You can take five to six weeks off too if you like, but try something short. Uh, number two, uh, find a challenge that really challenges you. And uh, number three, uh, you know, just try something as simple as, as switching up some uh, reps and sets, okay? Ben! Oh boy, here we go. Ben, I'm the Latin teacher with the fiancé of Awful Kettlebell Snatch last April. Uh, these were people who visited me. Sarah and I are happily married. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'd allow my daughters to marry someone with poor technique, but this is me. I've been doing even easier strength for a while now, and my bench has increased effortlessly, but my deadlift feels stuck. 60% of my one rep max in deadlift is taxing on the back, which is much less than my bench press. Is this normal? Should I change anything? You know, uh, Ben, uh, the issue is probably very simple. Um, there might be 20 or 30 deadlift variations. You might simply have chosen the wrong deadlift variation. If you're doing them from the floor, and the way you're born isn't uh, means the bar shouldn't be right there. It's at the top of my socks when I wear uh, tube socks uh, is where the bar is. Uh, sh shifting to something like a rack deadlift, uh, either one inch above or one inch below the knees might be a good idea. There's that Jefferson deadlift where you the bar is between your legs and you it's also called the straddle deadlift and you do a set here and you do a set here. There's the hack deadlift. There's the snatch grip deadlift. Um, they, we, you put your heels together. What um, you know, we uh, the duck sometimes called the duck position, uh, duck deadlifts. Um, there's that deadlift where you stand, you, you straighten up, you take a step back, a step forward, and you put it down. I'm wondering if your deadlift variation is the issue. Uh, we are all built a little differently, and maybe it is simply um, you need to explore another variation of the deadlift. Why don't you look into that for me, try that, and then get get back to me. Every time I've had a question on, on easy strength or even easier strength or any of those programs involving the deadlift, almost universally, it is the, the choice of the technique you use that is causing the lack of growth. Um, I, I know that some people on the internet, and of course, if you're on the internet, you are an expert, uh, don't like the trap bar. I don't necessarily like the trap bar, but oddly, the trap bar has done miracles for a lot of people I have great respect for, including my brother Gary, who's the trap bar uh, became, is the base of all of his training. Um, he's 71 or 72 now, and he does trap bar deadlifts three days a week. Uh, that's not bad. If he was using the barbell, I'm not sure he'd be doing that. So maybe it's just something as subtle as changing your 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 variation on the deadlift, um, and don't and don't let anybody tell you that this is good and this is bad. You're doing fine, man. Okay, thanks, Ben. Well, that's it for now. Remember, if you have questions, send those questions to podcasts at danjohnworkouts.com. I'm here to answer them for you. Thank you so much.